So if you want to join me, you can open up your Bible or your phone for the three of you who actually bring the book with you and don't use your phone. Uh, We're going to be in Luke chapter 24. We're going to be starting in verse 13. But before we begin, I want to warn you, we are a church where I make people talk to each other. So if that's not your thing, this is probably not the right place for you. Uh, So as we get in, so my parents... uh, I talked a lot as a child. I'm, I'm the youngest. Is anyone else here the youngest in the family? Right? Like, you just got to get words in when there's space to get it in. Amen? Right? Like, the older siblings, they just talk all the time. They're a little overbearing. Like, my siblings aren't watching because they're still sleeping because they're in California. So I can say whatever I want at this point. But, but I always was talking as a child. And I love to ask questions. Right? And as an adult, uh, I have a proclivity to continue to ask slightly funny questions. So here's what we're going to do before we start and before we jump into this. If you could be on a, the, a fly on the wall for any event that happened in history, what would it be? So you're not actually a fly for those of you who don't get illi- like it's an illustration, uh, an allegory. I don't know. It's something. Uh, English was a long time ago. Um, but I would like you to think about one event in history that you would just love to see, okay? Think, take a moment, think about it, and then I want you to turn to someone by you and tell them what it would be. Like, maybe it was the 49ers winning their fifth Super Bowl, because I'm a 49ers fan. Uh, maybe it was the Lions winning the Super Bowl. I don't know if that's ever happened. <laughs> Sorry, anyway, I don't know what it is, but go ahead. Sorry, it's just too easy, man. Uh, anyway, uh, so I want go ahead and look at someone and say, like, what event in history would you have wanted to see and be a part of on your mark? And if you say the resurrection, you're fired. Don't suck up. Don't say that. Look at someone else and answer the question on your mark. It said, go. What would you want to see? Barb, tell, tell Dietra. She's sitting by herself, too. Come on. Let's do it. I'm calling you out if no one's talking to you. All right, what were some of the things people said? Yell it out. What are some of the things you'd want to see if you can see anything? The Steelers 6. The Steelers 6? Oh, no. Oh, oh out. Whoa, you want, that wasn't that long ago, sir. You don't have to go back much in time. Be gentle, man. That was last year. I went into COVID with that heartbreak, just so you know. Right? Like, and I, okay. This, this is not in there. Anyway, my cousin thought it'd be a great idea to get married on a palindrome. So she got married when the Super Bowl started on Super Bowl Sunday. So she could get married 0-2-0-2-2-0, something like that. It's a terrible life choice. So I didn't even get to watch them lose. It was horrible. Anyway, what other things, would, anything in history, what would you want to see? Go. The, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. The signing of the Declaration of Independence. All right, what else? The birth of Jesus. The birth of Jesus. I would want to be there like an hour after, if everything's cleaned up. <laughs> I have three children, like it's, I'm like, clean it up before I touch it. You're precious and everything, but clean that up. All right, what else? Come on, yell it out. Landing on the moon. moon. Would you want, you'd want to be there. It's terrifying. All right, good talk. You want to be there when they argued. You want to watch people argue. I like it. All right, come on, give me a few more. What else? Anything in history at any time, what would you want to see? The The building of the pyramids, the whole way or just part of it? It's a long wait, bro. That's, I like it. Big moment in history. Long moment. Awesome. I like it. What else? Give me a couple more. D-day. What? D-Day. D-Day. All right. That's intense. The creation of the universe. That would be, that's really, I didn't even think about that. That's good. All right. Well, give me a couple more. The parting of the Red Sea. See how muddy it is to walk across. Got it. What else? Come on. Give me a few more. You want to see Noah's Ark? All right. What else? What'd you say, Barb? Uh, Okay, stole it. No, you went twice and stole someone else's. No more talking in the back. All right. So when I asked my dad this question growing up, which I probably asked like 50 times because I think it's a fun question. I have a degree in history, right? That's why I became a pastor because you can't do anything else with that degree. Uh, Sorry for anyone else who has a degree in history. Uh, You had good choices like me in life. Um, And my dad said, I would like to be on the road to Emmaus on that seven mile walk. And every time I asked him the question, which was a lot, because I was a very irritating child and young adult, and maybe adult still, but what the heck, he always said the same thing, that there was a journey that happened on Easter 2,000 years ago where these two men took a walk and Jesus started walking alongside them. And that's where we're going to be today. We're going to be in this moment on Easter 
where Jesus opened up and revealed the always and forever plan to make back into right relationship a creation and a people that had been scattered and separated from God. That in the ugliness of the cross and the beauty of the empty tomb, we get to be back in right relationship with God, not based on mine and yours perfection, but based on whose perfection? Jesus. So I want you to, before we start, look at someone around you and say, I know you're not perfect. Husband and wives are like, I didn't need to say that. (laughs) Or any parent who got their kids ready this morning. (laughs) I don't want to wear that. You know, that's never happened to anyone. I have three daughters. There's strong feelings on what we wear each day. All right. So the book of Luke was written by a doctor, and it was written about... 35 years after the death of Jesus. So if those of you who are with us for the last 13 weeks, the Luke that we talked about last week, who was Paul's traveling companion for his last 15 years, he wrote the book of Luke and he wrote the book of Acts. They're just one big giant book that we lop into two, right? Put one with the gospels and then one after. Luke was a physician. So he writes things a little more cerebrally. Sometimes you read John and there are like feelings all over the place. And he calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. And there's just so many feelings that I don't understand. But Luke is a doctor, and, and what he ended up doing is, is after Paul was martyred, he went back to, to Israel and actually interviewed the people and talked to people who actually saw these things firsthand. That's why his account feels a little, sometimes a little more like medical notes and straight to it stuff uh, than the emotive experience of someone who was there firsthand. Um, and so that's how he got this information. Um, And it's fascinating. So I want to quickly set you up three days before this on Friday, Jesus died. And then Jesus died in the afternoon on a Friday, the Jewish calendar, the days end at what time in the day? At sunset. So their days don't switch in the middle of the night. Their days switch. It's whenever it hits sunset, the next day, sorry, he dies on a Friday. This is Sunday morning. We just read in the beginning of service, the women ran to the tomb because Jesus' body was hastily prepared. They knew which tomb it was, because Lou said they followed um, the folks who put him in the tomb in the previous chapter. And they went there, and what happened? What was in the tomb? Nothing. Nothing. And an angel spoke. It's never happened to me, but I imagine I'd be freaked out. So were they. They laid down on the ground and hid their faces. And the angel said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? And then they booked it, told the disciples, and because they had great faith, did they believe the women? No, right? Because every, because never mind, I'm not going to touch that. (laughs) Sometimes men don't believe other people other than their own self and their own feelings. I don't know what that's like, Um, but I've heard that might be true on occasion. And then Peter runs to the tomb comes back and says, it's empty, the cloth's just sitting there, and the disciples are just sitting in this tension, and Luke just leaves it there, no resolution. And then we're snapped forward to here, so let's pick it up in verse 13. Uh, If you want to read along with me, you can, it'll be up on the screen, you can read it from your Bible, I read it out of the ESV, you read it out of whatever you want. If you read it out of the King James, no one's going to understand what you're saying, though. All right, so continue on. So verse 13, that very day, two of them, meaning two disciples and followers of Jesus, were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. So the Sabbath finished their walking, probably where they're from. And they were talking with each other about all the things that had just happened that I just summarized before. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. So Jesus just died. The women went to the tomb, empty, angel talking, linens laying flat. Disciples think it's a great idea to walk home. So they start on this journey, and out of nowhere, who shows up? Jesus is like, hey, I'm here. So he just starts walking alongside and chatting with them. All right, let's pick up in verse 17. And he, being Jesus, said to them, what is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Why might they be sad? Just be clear. Because Jesus died, right? They thought it didn't work. He promised to bring a new kingdom where there would be no evil. 
where tears would pass and there would be a restoration between humanity and God and Jesus died. And they were sad. Then one of them named Cleopas, good old Cleo, answered him, are you the only vizier, visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus says, this is hilarious, what things happened? <laughs> Just like think about for a second, like Jesus walks up to these disciples that have walked with him, followed him, and they're telling him what happened. And Jesus like plays along. Like, I don't know if Jesus is kind of a troll, right? And just kind of messing with him just a little bit. Or if Jesus is just choosing to be present in their pain. Don't know exactly what Jesus is doing here. But he says, what things? And they said to him, these things. So let's, let's listen to what they say about Jesus. Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and the people and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all of this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some woman, women in our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and when they did not find the body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said to them that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see. I love how Jesus gives space for them to pour out their heart to him even though we already knew what happened, right? There is like an empathy and a love that Jesus has by choosing to sit with them in the midst of their pain and in their midst of their sadness, not correcting it, but choosing to be present. Go ahead, take a, do a thought experiment with me. When you're sad, how helpful is it when someone tries to fix you being sad? How many people's sadness have been fixed by someone just being really positive around them? Raise your hand. What about them trying to explain it all away? <laughs> anyone? Is that, has that fixed it for anyone before? In the midst of our sadness, the comfort that as people that God created us to be is if someone just sits with us and is present with us in that moment. Because you can't fix sadness like that. You can make someone laugh. But it doesn't fix what's on the inside. What, gets, what fixes that deep brokenness and disappointment on the inside is people who choose to be present with us regardless. Are okay if we're just sad. And we've all had people like that, and we've probably all been that. We see someone sad, so we try to fix it. Right? But God being perfect and wise, the God-man Jesus, chooses to just be present with their suffering and present in the midst of their sorrow. I love the list. I love the way that they describe who Jesus was. They described where he was from. They called him a prophet. Uh, if you don't know, uh, the last prophet in Israel before like John the Baptist and Jesus showed up, it had been 400 years since someone had spoken authoritatively in the nation of Israel uh, from God. 400 years Israel went without a prophet before this. They said he was a prophet. Said that Jesus was mighty in deed and in word. That he was crucified. And that they had heard a rumors that he rose from the dead. The only thing that these disciples had to go on was the testimony of others, and they were slow to believe. And how do we know that they didn't believe that he rose from the dead? Why? Why do we know that for sure that they didn't believe that at this point? Because they were sad, right? Like if they thought he was no longer dead, okay, just think about this. You love someone, they die, you find out they're alive, are you still sad at that point? No, you are freaking out. Right? Like, it's like when I offer my kids cookies and they jump up and down or candy and they're like, yes, delicious. That's kind of what they sound like in my head. They don't actually talk that low. They're like a four, six and eight year old little girl. So they don't have that octave at this point in their life. Right? And Jesus was incredibly patient in revealing himself to them. 
And I love that. I don't know about you. God has been exceedingly patient in my life. Like there are times in my life where uh, God may have been willing to reveal himself, but I was less than interested. Anyone else experienced that once or twice? It's just me. That's good. But Jesus is incredibly patient as he revealed his thing. And, and so they pour out their heart to Jesus, this person who they don't know, that they're randomly walking on a road with on a seven-mile journey. And Jesus turns back to them, and here's what he says. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, <laughs> and slow of heart, to believe all the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I think there's a couple really important things that just happened. Jesus wasn't being mean to them. The word foolish there just means unwise, right? Knowledge, wisdom, two different things. You can have knowledge when you're 20. You can have wisdom when you've got a few more years under your belt. It's knowledge that gets put in action. And he says, you are slow in heart to believe what I have spoken. I love, I think it's fascinating. Often when we want someone to change, what do we do? If you run into someone and you think something they believe is wrong, what do you immediately do? You, you correct them, right? Anyone here like to argue with people? Put your hand up, Scott. I've never, Ruth, Ruth, thank you. <laughs> Just helping you out if you didn't know who you were. Yeah, no problem. No, I'm serious. Did you put your hand up, David? Okay, good. I was making sure. The people have gotten arguments with me in the first couple months. That's who I'm calling out. But anyway, right, often what do we try to change? Do we try to change people's minds when we think they're wrong? How well does that, when was the last time you've seen someone's heart change by arguing with them with their mind? Raise your hand if you've seen that happen recently. Yeah. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. That's not how people are transformed. Jesus says, I will come and just renew your mind. No, he said, I'm going to renew your mind and then give you a new what? Give you a new heart. That God's in the business, not just of making us want to think rightly and act rightly, but God's in the business of the slow process of changing our hearts and bringing us to a place where we want things that are different than we had before. Jesus didn't just argue intellectually with them. What they needed instead was the slow, patient revelation. Try that again. Slow, patient revelation of Jesus explaining him dying on the cross was not plan B. From the very beginning in Genesis chapter 3, we see that Jesus dying to overcome evil was the plan from the very beginning. And so Jesus on this journey, and this is why my dad loves this scripture. He just wants to be there as Jesus explains the whole Old Testament. Anyone here ever read anything in the Old Testament that made you feel like, I don't know what's going on right there? Anyone ever read something that seemed a little odd? Okay, Je these people are super blessed. Jesus like walked through the whole book, right, and explained everything in a seven-mile journey. And he says he began with Moses. Moses is a person that wrote the first five books of the Bible, all the way through the prophets, the people who spoke the, as a mouthpiece of God, and he interpreted for them all of the scriptures concerning himself. And I think there's two incredibly important parts and things that Jesus is doing right here. First, he says, like, just so you know, Old Testament, New Testament, same God, same heart, same desire to restore people to God. When Solomon, who built the temple, probably the most, one of the more famous people in the Old Testament, real wise guy, like not in a criminal sense, wise guy, but in a uh, intelligent guy sense. When he christened, the, when, they, when they blessed the temple, his prayer was that it would be a place for people everywhere to come and hear about God. And throughout the Old Testament, we see, and Jesus expounds, and I'm not going to go into it. I might post something on Facebook later where you can go and do some reading, and you can see that because that's like another 40 minutes, and nobody wants to be here for that long. So we're not going to do that right now. But there's a lot of fantastic things, and I'll, I'll post up some links this week if you want to do some more reading of, of places where God reveals his heart and his long plan to make right this broken world. So Jesus, walk with them. 
And then we pick it up in verse 28, keep going. So they drew near to the village to Emmaus, to which they were going. He acted as if he was going further. So Jesus was just kept walking. But they urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and he blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were open and they recognized him and he vanished from their sight. Then said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? The English does not quite do verse 29 justice. Uh, how many people have dropped off their like preschooler to uh, preschool the first day? Anyone remember that? What was that like? Unless they were my third kid who just said bye <laughs> and just left. I was like, I don't care. I'm not, can I have a hug? Nope. Just walked in, didn't even care. But what, what did, especially your first kid, what did your first kid do when you first dropped them off? You cried, but what did they do? Did they hold on? Any, anyone's kid, like, hold on to them and, like, wouldn't let go for love nor money, right? You just had to, like, leave them crying. You know, never experienced that as a parent? Uh, that is, like, the urgency of the, when they say they urged him strongly, it's like this image of grasping on and, like, begging someone to stay. It wasn't like just stay with us. There was something stirring in their soul. And there was something about this encounter with Jesus as Jesus revealed himself and revealed God's plan that you just like held on like vice grips and said, you're staying at our house for dinner. And what did Jesus do when they invited him in? He came. Like they wanted more from Jesus. They wanted Jesus to reveal himself to them. And what did Jesus do? He entered in. And he fully revealed who he was, right? As he spoke before and revealed God's plan, it says that their hearts burned. But when they invited him in and pleaded him, he chose to come and reveal himself to us. Like, isn't that so many, for those of us who love and follow Jesus, isn't that so many of our stories like we get like a taste of Jesus and there's something that like stirs in our heart, but eventually like we press in and we want to experience more. Like as Christians, we often call those mountaintop experiences where that uh, N.T. Wright, my favorite theologian, calls them thin places. I love it. So he calls them thin places in life where, where our existence and the heavenly existence gets close. Like if you think back on your life, those places where you just felt that, that, that space between the invisible and the invisible got close to one another and God was close. This was one of those moments for the disciples. And I love that this is clearly not wealthy people. They went inside and what did they offer Jesus? Bread. Just bread, <laughs> right? This was a meager meal of a normal person. Like they offered what they had and he took what was there and he broke it and blessed it and revealed himself to them. And their eyes were opened. And then what does Jesus do? He's gone. That in his resurrected body, physics is complicated. And he vanished from their sight. And they're left there looking at each other saying like, was your heart burning when he spoke too? <laughs> was it not bubbling up? Let's pick it up in verse 33. And so here's what they did. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the 11 and those who were with them gathered together saying, the Lord has risen indeed and has, and has appeared to Simon. Then they told them what happened on the road, how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. So they rose up that hour. Uh, how many people have run seven miles before in one shot? I've never done that. I like sweating after driving seven miles, so I could not <laughs> fathom running that far. Right? Some, it's dark. I'm just going to like let you in. There's no street lights at this point. What happens when it's dark when there's no lights? 
It's really dark, right? They get on the road. It's almost nighttime. And what do they do? They run. I mean, I imagine they're running. I don't imagine like, oh, man, let's go. All right. (laughs) Jesus just showed up and then vanished. It was real weird. No, they like book it seven miles back into town, bust in on the rest of the disciples who are gathered together. And what do they do? They share what God did. Right? They rose up that very hour, returned to Jerusalem, and after a seven mile walk, they were able to share the good news of Jesus' resurrection. I think it's fascinating. And we're not going to be able to get to the rest of the chapter. I want to encourage you, before the day's done, finish chapter 24. It's not that long. It will take you like five minutes. Like, I believe you can do it. And even if you don't believe you can, there's like an app. It will read it for you. It's not that complicated. But Jesus continues for the rest of this time to reveal himself to each person in the way in which they need. And I think it's fascinating, right? The women came to an open, to the empty tomb, and the angels proclaimed that he was risen. And what did they do? They believed. Right? These disciples were walking on a road going home thinking that that whole Jesus guy, what he promised was never going to happen. And God came, came and met them in the midst of their doubt. And later on in the day, the disciples are together. Jesus shows up and says, it's true. And we worship a God who reveals himself to people. It's in God's very nature as the revealer of mysteries and himself to be in relationship with other people. So as we finish up today, I have two invitations. Uh, So I'm going to pick on the people in the room who are already followers of Jesus. Uh, So if you're not, you get to ignore me for 30 seconds as I pick on them. Uh, But don't worry, everyone, it's equal opportunity, so game on. So I want to invite you, we're about to take communion. Uh, Jennifer, you want to come up? You can just start playing. It will make me wrap up anyway sooner if you play along. And like those first followers of Jesus, I want to challenge you before you come up to remember those places where God has been near to you in your life. One of the things that said over and over in the Old Testament is to remember what the Lord your God has done. And so before we take communion, before we take this time to share this meal, where we celebrate Christ's body, broken. Oh, I just threw bread everywhere. Awesome. And his blood poured out. I want to invite you to take a moment and remember and to thank God. And I wanted you to do more than just remember. I want to challenge you before the day's done, Tell someone around you about one of those moments in your life where God showed himself faithful and drew close to you. It's interesting. The disciples' first inclination wasn't just to sit in the room and talk about how amazing that experience was. Instead, they went out and what did they do? They shared the blessing of what God's presence in their life and went and shared it and blessed other people with it. God shows up in our life not just so that we experience something cathartic and transformational, but to be part of the transformation that God wants to do in the lives of people around us. And if you're here today and you wouldn't consider yourself yet a follower of Jesus, I just want to encourage you. If you don't know if God is real, if you don't know what you believe, I, I think God's deeply comfortable with our doubt and our lack of understanding. But I want to challenge you today, if you've never done this before, to take a moment and to pray. As Christians, we don't have special access to God. It's equal opportunity. There's two types of people in the world. What are those two types of people? It's Jesus and who? Everybody else. Everybody else is the right answer. There are two types of people. Jesus and everybody else. And and that Jesus, that God man Jesus, wants each person to know and to receive and to experience the goodness and the fullness that he has. So I want to encourage you that in the midst of doubt, in the midst of discerning, just to challenge you to take a moment and to pray. 
and ask God, hey, God, if you are true and if this is who you are, in some way make yourself known. And we believe that the revealer of mysteries and the God of all comfort will come and reveal and make himself known in his time. So church, let's pray. Jesus, we are so grateful for your faithfulness in our lives, for the way in which you reveal yourself in the present, for the ways in which you revealed yourself in the past. And we look expectantly to the ways in which the ways that you have shown yourself in our life can be used to bless and encourage others. Lord, I pray for people in this room right now who are figuring out where they're at with you and deciding whether to place their faith, Lord, and hope in you. Lord, I pray for a spirit of courage or that they would pray. And in the midst of that prayer, Lord, that you would speak to them. And Lord, I pray in particular if anyone's Lord, like the disciples' heart is stirring as they hear the message of the gospel. Lord, would they share with you what's stirring in their hearts. Lord, and find someone to share it with them. Lord, we are grateful that you rose from the dead. Lord, and you welcome welcome us to partake of this meal, of the bread broken and your blood poured out, reminding us of your sacrifice and the life that comes through you. Jesus, we honor you. Jesus, we praise you. We pray these things in Jesus' name.